Next up, Casey is going to tell us about lot pre-programming for the masses. All right. Come on. All right, so uh, this is joint work with Theo, who was an intern last year uh, working on uh, uh, the library. So developing concurrent programming libraries is an enormous undertaking. And uh, libraries like Java.util are concurrent and concurrent collections for the .NET platform represent years of programmer effort. Um, and these are expert programmers. And uh, they also tend to incorporate uh, very subtle invariants for performance, which makes them really hard to modify, build, and extend. What they do provide you is uh, a whole bunch of uh, synchronization and data structures, um, also specialized for a variety of uh, blocking, non-blocking behaviors, asynchronous behaviors, internal representations, and so on. It's quite handy. So it's, uh, the libraries are quite comprehensive. Uh, but the critical problem with, this, uh, with these libraries is that uh, these libraries are not composable. Uh, what do I mean by this? Let's look at a small example. Suppose you have uh, a log-free stack implementation, which provides uh, two operations push and pop, um, and assume that uh, these operations are atomic. Now a developer wants to write a scalar app. Uh, what it does is it pops from one of the stacks and pushes a value into another. All right, um, he makes a lot of money, and then now he wants to improve the app. Where, okay, so now he wants to atomically push from one stack and uh, pop from one stack and push into another. Since the library doesn't provide an abstraction to compose together these operations, uh, he's basically stuck. He can use this influence and uh, ask nicely uh, to the library developers to put an operation into the library called uh, pop push, which will do this operation atomically. Um, but this isn't a scalable um, venture. Moreover, adding operations to uh, log-free um, concurrent programming libraries is uh, difficult in general because you have to reason about the correctness of the new operation with respect to every other operation in the library that might race with it. So the question I wanted to ask is um, whether we can improve this situation somehow. So in particular, um, we do want to build scalable log-free programming libraries. But we also want uh, the clients of the libraries, the developers, to um, compose and extend uh, the libraries without depending on the libraries providing additional operators, um, additional atomic operators. So it turns out uh, there is a solution for this, and uh, the abstraction is called reagents. Um, it was introduced by Aaron Turon in his uh, PLDA 2012 paper. Um, and the key idea of reagents is that um, it provides abstractions for expressing and composing fine-grained concurrent programming libraries. One of the nice aspects about this library is that uh, um, it came after all of the uh, developments. So it managed to take in um, sequential composition in the spirit of software transaction memory, join calculus in the spirit of, sorry, parallel composition in the spirit of join calculus, and selective communication from concurrent ML managed to squeeze them together in the same library, but uh, does it uh, in a fashion that the whole protocol is still lock free And this is the cool part about this library. Um, before I get into the details, like where does all this power come from? Um, it's composition. As functional programmers, we love functions. Uh, given a function from A to B, we can take a function from B to C, put it together, and get a function from A to C. And the other thing we can do with functions is apply it. So reagents provide you a similar abstraction. Uh, they are arrows. Um, and uh, what they represent is an atomic protocol. And uh, one thing that you can do with reagents is take two atomic protocols and then compose them together. To make a larger atomic protocol, you can also run them. The guarantee that you have is um, any way that you compose these atomic protocols together, you still have log freedom. So when you, when it comes down to thread interaction, uh, there are usually two opposing camps. One which argues that you have to do all thread interactions or shared memory references, and another 
argues that uh, all threads should be actors and they have to exchange messages over type channels. Um, Reagents fully embrace both of them. Uh, in particular, they provide chat memory references, but also provide synchronous communication channels. So the abstraction of a channel is just an endpoint, um, which consumes messages of type uh, code A and produces messages of type code B. The way you make a channel is uh, um, using the make chan primitive, which returns you a pair of endpoints, and they are duals of each other. The types are duals of each other. And the only operation that you can do on the channel is uh, swap on it. So swapping on the channel gives you a reagent value. And the behavior is that if a thread swaps on a channel, it is blocked until a matching communication is available uh, on the dual channel. And the whole protocol atomically uh, transfers the elements, exchanges the messages between the threads, and they go on their uh, merry ways. References are a bit more interesting. Um, you can create new references, but uh, reagents don't allow naked writes and reads from uh, references. So the way you update a reference is you take a reference and you provide it the higher order function, uh, f, which is applied to the current value of the reference, an input value to the reagent. And what you're supposed to return um, is an option pair. Suppose f returns some pair of values. This signifies uh, this uh, write can be done. You update the um, reference to the new value, and the reagents returns value of type uh, code C. Um, but you can also return none, which signifies that um, the protocol cannot be completed. The references that you've um, read so far using this particular uh, update uh, strategy is not what you expect it to be. So the thread blocks until there is a um, new write on this uh, particular reference, in which case the thread is woken up. So if a protocol reads a bunch of uh, references and then say it does one of these updates and returns none, the thread blocks waiting on all of these references internally. And when there is a write to any one of these references, there is a state change, there is possibility of forward progress, so we re-execute. So this is, um, this expresses the same um, capability as what you have with GHC's, uh, uh, GHC STM's retry primitive. Okay, so we have this uh, um, X abstraction. So what can we do with it? We can implement a log-free uh, stack um, as follows. So we represent stack as a reference to a list of values of type alpha. We create a stack by returning a reference to an empty list. Um, let's look at push. So push is applied on uh, the current uh, um, push is applied on the stack, which updates uh, the stack by applying this higher order function. The x is here is the current state of uh, the stack, which is just a list. X is the value that you want to push. Since push does not block, you always return a pair of values, where you append uh, x to the head of the list and say, oh, this is the new value of the list. Go try to cache update this. Um, and uh, if successful, just return a uh, unit as the resultant value. So the important thing is um, um, this particular, um, if you do not have any contention, this particular protocol, if you perform a push, it's only going to do a single cast underneath. <coughs> POP is a bit more interesting. It follows along the same uh, behavior. Um, you try to update uh, the reference where uh, the higher order function is applied to the uh, current state of uh, uh, the stack. L is the current um, value of um, uh, the stack. And unit, because pop doesn't take any input. You pattern match on L. If uh, the list is empty, um, OK. So one thing I want to say is I want to express uh, blocking uh, pop operation. So a pop will block um, until there is a value on the stack. So we can simply express this as returning a none. Um, and if you do have values, you just uh, try to um, provide a pair where you say the new state of the stack is the tail of the list, and the value you have to return is x, which is the head of the list. Again, if you do not have any contention, this just does a single compare and swap. So the takeaway from this uh, example is that it looks and feels like a sequential stack implementation. 
it makes no mention of compare and swaps, uh, retries, back off, or any other protocols that you would require. So compare and swap um, is an expensive uh, uh, primitive because uh, it involves a full memory fence. So uh, it is typical of uh, high performance concurrent algorithms to not spin on compare and swaps because then it would be really bad. So reagent protocol um, under the hood takes care of all of the retry back off and the programmer has this nice interface on top. The other thing that I want to mention is um, there's no mention of threads. Um, so we do blocking and non-blocking behavior, wait and notify and so on. Um, so it's quite nice. Uh, this abstraction doesn't talk about threads, but you still have the blocking wake up behaviors that you would expect. So expressive power of reagents is due to combinators. So you can sequentially compose uh, uh, two reagent protocols as you would expect. We also have uh, choices, um, which is left biased. So you try the first protocol on the left sorry, protocol on the left first. And if that uh, cannot be completed, then you try the protocol on the right. Um, and if both of them block, you just block until one of them is enabled and you return that value. You also have a, a parallel composition operator which waits for both of the protocols to be enabled and then atomically discharges um, the whole protocol, returning you pair of values that comes from both of the protocols. What can you do with this? So our application developer who's writing this uh, killer app can now write this uh, actual, like implement this feature, which is popping from one stack and pushing into another. Um, you can also try to um, consume elements atomically from two different stacks, um, which isn't surprising. And then you can consume elements from either of the stacks. Um, so this protocol um, like waits for elements from one of the stacks, and if both are blocked, you block until one operation is available, you pop from the stack, whole protocol runs to, runs to completion. So you can also, um, so re reagents library also comes with uh, other interesting combinators that, can, that you can use to transform any arbitrary blocking reagent into a non-blocking one. So we have a lift um, primitive that um, takes a pure function and produces a reagent, uh, returns a reagent, which uh, has the same type as the original function. We also have a constant um, function that uh, takes a constant value, always returns. When you run this reagent, you get the constant value always. So you can now implement an attempt reagent, which takes any reagent, blocking or non-blocking, and then makes a non-blocking reagent out of it. The way you do that is um, you make a, you choose between the original reagent, um, like suitably uh, coercing the return values, saying um, returning a, a some value instead of just the naked value, and uh, having it in a choice with constant one. So what's the behavior here? So since our choices are left bias, you try the first reagent. Um, if it returns, you get the value some value. If it blocks, you try the other one, uh, the second option, which always returns none. So you can take a blocking reagent and transform it to a non-blocking one um, using our combinators. And this is how we implement uh, the try pop uh, primitive. So we take a pop uh, operation that we implemented and then attempt on it. You get a try pop uh, um, behavior for the stack. So this uh, shows how composable reagents are. So the other thing that you can do is um, you can elegantly solve dining philosophers problem. Um, the idea is that we have a bunch of philosophers sitting around a table. They can, um, they can eat, they alternate between eating and thinking and uh, they only eat uh, if they can uh, take hold of both of the uh, forks. Uh, I know, uh, but the image is uh, from a fork because uh, I think they are eating spaghetti, so. <laughs> um. There is no Italian philosopher there. Oh, sorry? There is no Italian philosopher, you just need one. Uh, I know, uh, yeah, the problem is, uh, yeah. I apologize for that, but uh, moving on to the example. So this is, this is provided as um, exercise program for undergraduate students, teaching them how to do, um, how to prevent deadlocks in your um, concurrent programs, but also like how to prevent starvation. You don't want any of the philosophers to starve. 
So we can elegantly solve this using uh, reagents where we represent uh, fork as a pair of endpoints. Um, we make a fork by making a pair of endpoints. Um, we implement drop and take by simply swapping on uh, drop and take. And the actual um, eat function is, it is given a left and uh, right fork. And the first thing it does, it tries to atomically uh, swap on both the left and uh, right forks. And if that protocol succeeds, you've managed to get both of the forks atomically. Um, and only then will the rest of the uh, function be evaluated. The reagent protocol automatically takes care of making sure that uh, this protocol does not deadlock. So you are able to consume both of the forks atomically. And then once you've eaten, you just drop the forks by spawning threads um, so that uh, the other, uh, um, other philosophers might have a chance to eat. So the key to um, reagent's performance is um, its uh, implementation. So what we have is a two-phase execution, where in the first phase, we just accumulate all the gases. We run through the protocol, accumulate all the gases. We don't perform any writes. Um, there are no writes to perform because we are accumulating <laughs> gases. And in the second phase, we attempt a K compare and swap operation. So if the first phase, um, if we cannot accumulate all of the compare and swaps in the first phase, then we cannot complete the protocol. Uh, which we consider as a permanent failure. Um, if you have disjunctions, you sort of uh, try the first one, you cannot complete that, then you move on to the second one. If, uh, the sec if we are successful in accumulating all of the gases and we fail on um, attempting a KCAS, then it means that there is active contention from um, other threads. So this is a transient failure. You have active contention from other threads, but um, the only thing that you can go, do is uh, go back and try the entire protocol. So this is what we do underneath. Um, we have an efficient implementation of a K compare and swap. Um, and uh, there is a very nice paper from Tim Harris which says you can implement K compare and swap uh, using compare and swap um, using 3n plus 1 um, single word compare and swaps for um, compare and swaps of n words, So, which is what we use underneath. And uh, the other cool thing about uh, reagents is that um, we can now discharge the compare and swaps using hardware transactions. So if you buy a recent enough Intel uh, processor, you are very likely to have uh, Intel transactional synchronization extensions, which provide, uh, very sp which provide support for very small hardware transactions. So we have very promising results with uh, uh, TSX. So the intuition is that um, for discharging k compare and swaps, you have to do multiple compare and swaps in order, and each of those involve full memory fence. But with Intel TSX, you just have a single memory fence at the end of the protocol, and you save a lot of, uh, um, and that gives you performance. Of course, uh, there are so many reasons why this doesn't scale for uh, arbitrary transaction lengths, um, but this is really promising that we can, like. I hacked it uh, up in a weekend, so that's, uh, that's good. So some performance numbers, these are very early results. Um, in this example, we have uh, two, two consumers, two pr producers racing on a, um, racing on a uh, channel, and um, all of these producers and consumers are domains themselves. Um, and uh, the behavior that we want is um, a synchronous pop operation. So the blue line shows a busy poll where uh, the consumers um, poll on uh, loop and poll on uh, the channel to consume values. The lock and condition variable implementation, I should say, is uh, implemented using reagents. Um, and the last uh, two lines are driver stack and um, channels. So in this graph, lower is better. It is showing number of operations on x-axis and time on the y-axis shows that we can have uh, reasonable performance with, uh, I mean, this gives you the best performance, but the question is whether it gives best performance if you were to implement these protocols by hand. Um, I don't have the numbers here, but the takeaway is that um, it's about 30% um, slower than if you had um, like a handwritten implementation of this particular protocol 
um, when compared to reagents. The overhead that you see is due to abstraction. So we have higher order functions, we have combinators. So we suffer from allocations and we are not, multicore is not yet in uh, 403. So I'm hoping F lambda would magically make all of the allocation overheads go away. <laughs> um, this is more interesting. Um, we have a single consumer, but what we do is, um, we try to consume the values uh, non-atomically, uh, which is shown in the blue line, atomically, which is shown in this green line. And we also do this um, initial selective communication where we choose between the two channels and in the continuation of that uh, protocol, we consume the other one. Um, shows that um, the, the composition does have performance. The atomicity of uh, doing two operations together does have performance, but it's uh, um, you pay for what you uh, use, which is good. So, oh, one minute left. Okay, so I'll quickly I'll quickly run through this. So, um, so STM is both uh, GHC's STM implementation in particular is both more expressive more and less expressive than reagents. In particular, um, reagents provide you um, STM-like abstractions, but they also provide uh, synchronous communication channels. But we don't have um, naked, we don't have serializability that uh, GHC STM provides. So uh, the notion is that we don't allow um, a transaction to perform a naked write, and the continuation, like the subsequent operation in the same transaction to read the value. Um, we have this restriction that if you perform two um, compare and swaps on the same memory location, then the protocol cannot succeed. Uh, this is because of the underlying hardware restriction that K compare and swap uh, is done on disjoint set of memory locations. Um, the way I see it, um, reagents, um, STM in GHC provides very nice abstraction. So it provides serializability. As a programmer, you don't have to um, you get the expected semantics. Reagents do uh, have certain non-trivial abstractions where you, um, where programs might block, where you expect them to just proceed, run to completion. Um, but reagents are geared, geared towards performance. So you can, the whole idea is that we want to ensure that our protocols are lock-free. And if I'm not mistaken, STM implementation is GHC, in GHC is not lock-free. Um, it uses two-phase locking uh, in the last phase. They map nicely to hardware transactions. You don't need to run the initial uh, phase of accumulating gases using um, hardware transactions. You just need to run the k compare and swap in a hardware transaction, which is nice. Um, do I have any time? No. Not really. So ask me about how it compares to CML and ask me about how it compares to transaction events. And uh, we have an axiomatic semantics which tries to explain the expected behavior and trying to match it to operational semantics and proving it's lock free. There's a library. We are building a bunch of data structures. Please contribute. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So, programming with arrows is a bit tossing. Because you have to do all this sort of, it's all a very point free style and you do a lot of swizzling. It even has some rather well, arcane syntactic sugar to support it. How, how much of a problem is it syntactic? So we. The dining philosophers have got some sort of swap to all this. Yeah, so. Are the programs limited and conspicuous and easy to understand? Um, so we have uh, PPX bindings for uh, um, monads um, in. Um, in OCaml, but we don't have anything for arrows. But um, I think we discussed this issue before, which is that um, there's nothing that, um, so there's, there's prob uh, it's probably going useful to go through this particular example. So we do use uh, the fact that they are arrows um, um, in an interesting fashion. The fact that they are arrows uh, help us. Uh, we can discharge, um, so if we know that a particular protocol only has one compare and swap, um, we can immediately discharge the compare and swap and not go through this three and plus one compare and swap operation. So I don't want to shift to monads for uh, um, its syntactic, uh, um, exp its nicer syntax, um, but you can think of implementing like PPX transformers, PPX um, 
uh, extensions to for programming with arrows but i don't have real programs written so these are not like very large programs they they do get cumbersome um, but does that sort of answer your question? So, so are you saying that you could use a sort of monadic form at the cost of a little bit of performance? At, at the cost of a little bit of performance, but um, our, our idea is that um, if you only do um, a single compare and swap, which is the case with um, um, the Triber stack that we saw, if you only had pop, push and pop, we still need to like ensure that we have the same performance as handwritten implementation. That's the goal. So if we can try to do that, then we will do that. So the way we do that is by examining whether our protocol only has a single compare and swap, which you can examine with arrows because arrows are values and monadic uh, um, right hand side on the monad is a function. So we can't statically, we can't at runtime examine whether the right hand side is a, contains any casts or not. There are ways around it where you can say run through the casts. Uh, accumulate, see whether it has a single compare and swap, and then use uh, um, a single compare and swap operation. Can we discuss this? You, you accumulate a lot, don't you? We do accumulate a lot. Yeah, that's what you said. Yes. This is one. Well, just do that. Um, I, I, I guess I don't see that. That seems to be nothing to do with hours versus moments. I agree. It's a single to the lot. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, I think I should uh, try that. All right. Yes. Um, they are far more complicated, and I don't understand weight-free data structures enough. I don't know whether composability results can easily be proved. The k compare and swap operation um, is lock-free because we have someone who's worked out how to do multi-word lock-free k compare and swap. Um, I don't know if you have such a result for weight freedom, then you could uh, have that. Now? All right. Um, <laughs> so, if you remember the example from uh, Neil K's uh, keynote, so he implemented uh, the sync primitive, which does uh, receives and then uh, takes two channels, does two receives um, in the continuation. But the idea is that uh, concurrent ML commits too early. So it decides on the first uh, action that it's going to commit to a particular protocol. So you get a behavior where if you run this, if you have a single matching thread, that transaction, that particular thread runs to completion while the other one is still blocking. If you were to implement the same with three agents, they would block until all of the communications are satisfied and then all of the protocols like um, execute together. So that's the difference. Thanks, Casey. Thanks.